Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship today. Pastor Seth is playing the second of his music festivals this weekend down in Alabama. So uh, he will be traveling back today. Uh, He drove, which is crazy, but uh, that's what you do when you're young, right? Uh, So we look forward to seeing him back uh, with us next week. So uh, anyway, uh, I invite you to stand as you are able as we continue with our confession and forgiveness as you see it in front of you. Blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus, who bears the cross, the Spirit, who makes our joy complete. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others, for the harm we have caused, known and unknown. Forgive us for the unjust demands we place on others and your creation. Forgive us for the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor. Forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. And in Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. We begin by singing our opening hymn from the purple hymnal, if you want to use your hymnal. It's Faith Begins by Letting Go, and it's number 1004. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you you show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. 
You may be seated for the scripture readings. the people of Nineveh did, how they had turned from their evil ways. God changed his mind about the calamity, and he had said he would bring it, that he would bring it upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning? For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It, did, it came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also so many animals? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read, responsibly. we'll read responsibly Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. There is no end to your greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your power. I will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and all your marvelous works. They shall tell of the might of your wondrous acts, and I will recount your greatness. They, will, they shall publish the remembrance of your great goodness they will sing joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock and saw others standing idle in the marketplace, he said to them, You also go into the vineyard and I'll pay you whatever's right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. He said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay 
beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only about an hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But the landowner replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Let's pray. Gracious God, Oftentimes it is hard to understand your sense of justice. We have feelings about what that means, and it's not always what it means to you. So we ask that you open our hearts and minds this day to understand your generosity in a new way, that we might be freed to live our life in generosity with others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there was a moment when my daughter was in preschool uh, and they were doing, it probably was around President's Day or something, they were doing a little skit and at the end of the skit they were, said the Pledge of Allegiance together. And as they were saying the Pledge of Allegiance, um, you know, they started out quiet, right? So I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And then they got louder and louder, you know, and then with liberty and justice for all, you know, and they all screamed it. And I can just picture her face up to the sky, you know, and she screaming out with liberty and justice for all. It is what we often like to think that's what we're about in this country is a sense of fair play, of liberty and justice for all. We say that, right? We want to, we have you know, political uh, speech, stump speeches and events where people stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance, and we say those very words, do we not? With liberty and justice for all. And in our best moments, in the best moments of our lives together, that's what it's about, helping others, being fair with each other, caring for those on the fringes, but at our worst. We don't really care about our neighbors at all. We do anything to get what we want or what we feel we deserve. You know, there's a, there's every time this time of the year rolls around, you get, uh, for instance, NFL players that are holding out from their contracts that they signed because they feel, I deserve more money. So they have a contract that's signed, but they want more because somebody else got more. Right? I mean, the, the pundits always talk about that, right? So, you know, Pat Mahomes gets the largest contract ever for a quarterback, and then the next guy down says, wait a second, I'm just as good as Pat Mahomes. I should get what Pat Mahomes gets even though they're under contract. But the flip side is, we look at, at wages in this country that have been stagnant for years while CEOs and shareholders are making gazillion percent more than what these uh, workers are making. I saw a graph the other day that, you know, there's like some uh, uh, CEOs make, you know, across the world, 12%, 13%, 20% more than their workers, and the United States is 432% more money than the workers. With liberty and justice for all, a sense of fair play. But we know that while we say that, we don't live it. We choose not to live it. Now, lest we think that this is just an American problem, 
Our lessons for today show us it is definitely, most definitely not. It's a human problem. We have two stories that talk about this. This one thing, I'm just going to tell you right now, if you come away today with one sentence of understanding, this is the sentence, and you may or may not like it. God is not fair. Okay? God is not fair. Thanks be to God. So we get this wonderful story that Pat read from Jonah. And you know, you know the Jonah story, right? God calls Jonah as a prophet to go and preach at Nineveh, which they are the arch enemies. And the Ninevites are not nice people. They're terrible. They treat their folks terribly. And somehow God wants them to turn around because God always wants people to come back to God. God always wants people to be reconciled, to, to come back into the relationship for which God created them. And so he calls Jonah to go to Nineveh to, to preach a word that will help them to turn around. And you know, Jonah is like, huh, right, I ain't going there. He goes the opposite direction. Remember the story? He gets into a boat to go across the sea. And what happens? A big storm arises, you know, and the sailors are like, what the heck is going on, right? And finally Jonah's like, yeah, it's my fault. You got to throw me into the sea. It's my fault. This is God, you know, coming after me. So he gets tossed in the sea, much to the sailors didn't want to do it, but, you know, they didn't want to lose their lives either, either so they thought, eh, it's foreigner, we'll throw him in. So the fish swallows up Jonah, right? And then after three days of sitting there, Jonah says, well, life's got to be better if I'm alive and out on land. And so all of a sudden, you know, he kind of sings this song to God, a prayer to God, sort of, saying, yep, you're right, God, I should listen to what you're saying. And then the fish vomits him up onto the, so onto the shore, and he heads to Nineveh. And he goes to Nineveh, and he gives the worst sermon ever. One sentence, basically. Forty days, and Nineveh is toast. Now, maybe you've heard Hellfire and Brimstone sermons before. I don't know. Have you guys ever heard, you know, those? I generally don't do that, but, you know, that would be some kind of a sermon, wouldn't it? And it must have been effective because what happens? Everybody in Nineveh repents. Everybody, even the animals, wear sackcloth and ashes and repents. Now, you would think that Jonah could say, hey, that was pretty effective, right? Like, I'm a pretty good preacher. They did, but no. He's ticked. Why? Because he knows that God got what God was hoping for. And those Ninevites didn't deserve it. So he thinks, well, this stinks. You know, he went out after he preached and he sat outside in Nineveh just waiting for this destruction to happen. It was kind of like, you know, okay, let's see what's happening. And when it doesn't happen in and God kind of changes God's mind. It ticks him off. So God wants to teach him this lesson, right? And he, he, raises, he has this little shrub grow up overnight and gives Jonah shade. So in the heat of the day, he's got shade and it's okay until then at night the worm comes up and eats away at the bush and the heat of the day comes and Jonah experiences heat so much so that he becomes faint, and he just wants to die. It's too hot. He complains and complains and complains. Are you upset with me, Jonah, God says, because I choose to bring this people back into a relationship? Are you upset with me because I'm generous with my mercy? Interesting question, right? It tells about what God's desire is, and that is that all of creation comes back into a right relationship with God. The whole Old Testament is movement from the fall, from humans turning inwards to themselves to come back into a relationship with God. And you know what? It never works. I mean, 
God starts out with the patriarchs. The patriarchs try to get people back into a relationship with God, and it might work for a little while, and then it falls away. He sends judges and kings and finally prophets, and the people never turn back. Why? Because they're not interested in justice and fairness. They're not interested in a right relationship with God. They're interested in themselves. So God decides the only way that this relationship is going to be righted is by becoming human God's self. And so God becomes human in the form of this Jesus who was born to Mary. And as Jesus preaches and teaches and performs miracles, it's about bringing that kingdom with him to say, this is what the kingdom of God is like. This is what the kingdom of God is like. So if you want to look at who God is and what God's all about, maybe you should begin to imagine what the kingdom is like where there is true justice and true fairness and equality for all. In a sense, it's hard to read, hard to understand. You remember the parable he tells about uh, the shepherd who... uh, has his flock and he's got 99 sheep but one of them's lost and you remember what the shepherd does he leaves the 99 sheep and he goes in search for the one and it you know any good shepherd would never think about that because it's just one sheep out of a hundred and i'd rather make sure i got my 99 than and lose you know than lose them by searching after the one but he goes after the one and finds it and what does jesus say say There is more joy and celebration over this one sheep that was lost than the other 99 who didn't need to be found. Do you remember the story of the waiting father who had these two sons and the youngest son who came and asked for his inheritance basically said to his dad, you are dead to me. Give me my inheritance. And the dad does. And you remember the older son sticks around at home, kind of labors, takes over the farm, you know, but the older son thinks he's under his father's thumb the whole time. And when the youngest son is at his wit's end, when he has nothing left to live for, he chooses to come home. And his father runs, picks up his robe, and runs to meet his kid, which would never happen in that culture, picks him up and wants to celebrate because this son of his who was dead is alive. God is about a party. God is about welcoming. God is about receiving. God is about writing relationships. And so when Jesus stands to tell this parable of the laborers in the vineyard, it is a story that is about welcoming and graciousness. Even in the midst of inequality and jealousy, I mean, it's a great story, right? And we tend to think about it sort of as, uh, you know, the the inequality. What happens, you know, the first group, they get there in the morning. In in Jerusalem, it still happens to this day. And in small towns where I uh, spent my high school years in St. James down on the square, they had uh, day laborers that would come and then farmers would pick them up because they needed to get harvest in or they needed to get some work done. And so they'd pick up... Uh, workers, day workers in the morning and take them out to the fields. You can imagine this happening and so this landowner has this great abundance and he's got to get the crop in. Maybe he looked at uh, you know, a Jewish farmer's almanac or something in the first century and they said, it's going to be a quick fall, you better get your stuff in and so he uh, goes to hire these laborers in the morning and as, as he's looking at the fields, as they're working in the fields, he realizes, I need more help. We've got to get this crop in. And he goes back into town and gets another group. You know, and he says, I'll pay you the fair day's wage. I'll pay you what's fair. And so they're all, cool. And then the next group comes and the next group. And finally, at the end of the day, he goes to get this last group of workers. They're the last group hired. And it's not as somehow they are some lazy oafs that just, you know, moseyed up to the town square at 5 o'clock. These are the ones that get left behind. These are the ones that aren't picked. It's like, how many of you ever, you remember in in grade school when you're going to play K-1? 
kickball or something, and you had two captains pick. And you're all lined up on the line, and then the one captain says, I'll take him, or I'll take her. And you remember, who gets left? The tiny guy, or the big guy, or the fat guy, you know, the one who's on the fringe, they get left behind. Well, that's who these workers are at 5 o'clock, but the landowner says, I need help. I don't care. Come and work with me. And so they come, and they get the harvest in, and there's this great celebration, right? The harvest is done. The landowner is so excited because his crop is in. He's had all these people working, and so you can imagine his, uh, his financial secretary, right, who's got to pay these guys their wage. And they're thinking, okay, now what do I got to do? Let's see, this one worked uh, eight hours, this one worked six hours. Do I take a percentage of the full day's wage and knock it down so many percent to pay this one? And you can imagine going on his head, the landowner comes to his, his uh, financial secretary and says, you know what? Pay them all the same. Pay them the full day's wage. That, I'm so happy that we got this crop in. Just pay them all. So start with the last one hired first. So you can imagine, right? They, get, they come in and they're just happy to get something. They worked an hour or whatever, so happy to get something, and they hands them the envelope because no one ever just whips out cash, you know, or it has to hand out a little bag of shekels or something. You know, it just hands them an envelope, and they look in the envelope, and they're like, something's not right here, but I'm not going to tell anybody. You know, maybe the financial guy gave me the wrong envelope. Can you imagine the excitement of this guy that worked one hour? He got paid a full day's wage. In fact, his wage was enough to live for three or four days. And so he looks at that, and he's so excited. Can you imagine? He's not going to go anything to anybody right he goes as he's walking by the line they're all standing in line they're like check this out you know and so all the people that saw that going all the way back to the ones hired first in the morning are thinking if this guy's paying a full day's wage for one hour think of what i'm gonna get right think of what i'm gonna get they all get the same they are taken care of they are given enough to live on for three or four days. They are, taken, they are given what they agreed to do for, the whole, for their day's work, for their partial day's work. They are all taken care of. They are provided for. It is enough. And they gripe, right? Because they didn't get what they had hoped based upon what they saw from the persons that worked just an hour or so during the day. And they are ticked. And the landowner says, you're so upset because I choose to give my money the way I choose to give it, and you think you deserve more than what you agreed to. to. Am I not allowed to be as generous as I choose with what I have? It's a parable that you and I can relate to, am I not? How many of us would feel like we were robbed if we were hired at 8 in the morning, right? How many of us would be indignant? Well, the nerve of the landowner to, to, to only pay me for a full day's wage when they gave this person something else. We live that every day. We sit in our offices and we look over our cubicles and we say, look at what that person's getting. Grass is always greener on the other side and so we live our lives as if there's only fair sense of fair play if I get what I want. So here's the rub. If we think that we getting what we deserve, what do you deserve? What do you deserve from God? What did you do that makes God give you anything? What do you do to earn your way into God's goodness and grace and merit? How have you lived your life this week? When have you lived your life in total love for others? When have you loved God with your whole heart and your whole soul and your own mind and your strength? When have you reached out to those in need and helped them this week? How often have you given of your whole self for someone else? I, 
It's not me. I think about my own wants and needs always. First, now if there's some, if I have a little goodness left over from taking what I want, I'm happy to share, but I'm going to take care of myself first. Luther said this is a daily struggle, right? He said it's simul justus et peccator. It is I am constantly in this tug of war with myself. Saint and sinner. Forgiven and sinful. If God was fair according to our rules of fairness, we wouldn't be sitting here this morning. But God's not fair. God's not fair because God loves you for who you are. God's not fair because God loves you because God made you. And God loves everything that God made. In that first creation story, and God saw that it was good. And behold, it was very good. God is not fair, but thanks be to God. Amen.
you may be seated for the prayers of the day. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. God, who is gracious and merciful, teach your church to invite and welcome all. Lead us to be grateful for the blessings of community. Challenge your church to choose equity and compassion over judgment. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God, who sends the wind and the sun, you know every worm and bush by name. Help us remember that even the humblest parts of creation are precious to you. Show us how best to care for the earth and its creatures. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God, who is ready to relent from punishing, impart your compassionate wisdom to legislators, judges, members of the military, and law enforcement. Give them courage to serve their communities in times of uncertainty, stress, or exhaustion. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God who saves, direct your people who are tempted by evil ways. Protect your children from calamity and disaster. Strengthen all who are incarcerated. Encourage all who are in despair or pain of any kind especially Scott and Ann, Bev, Mark, John, Dick, and Ray. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God, who is slow to anger, may we boast about the goodness of Jesus with the confidence of Paul in prison. Inspire us to find abundance in whatever vocation we are called to in the world and in service to our congregation. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God, who abounds in steadfast love, we give thanks for the saints called to the kingdom of heaven, especially Muriel. Unite with them in spirit. Hold us firm as we labor in this life and look to the life to come. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these and the prayers of our heart, trusting in your compassion made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let's take a moment and share that peace with one another. God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table that all might be fed. Form us into the body of your beloved, 
Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Thank you, Ken. Uh, as we begin uh, to prepare for communion, just a reminder that there's going to be uh, railing communion, so we welcome you to come forward to the altar railing, and then there will be a station for gluten-free in the front, in the middle, so if you need that, you can uh, uh, receive it there. And then after uh, communion, you can drop your cups in those white uh, bowls on your way back to your seats. I'm going to need two assistants for communion. Edie and Ed, you want to do that? Perfect. Thank you. So we begin. Dear friends, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus invites you to this table. Come, eat, and live. You may be seated.
That was my cue just to let John know we were ready. <laughs> May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word. Christ Jesus, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, where none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, again, thanks for coming to worship today. Uh, it's... Uh, Beautiful out there. I thought it was supposed to be raining this morning, so I'm happy about that. But glad that you could be here. Uh, as we remember, last week we kicked off kind of our education program, and so just a reminder, Sunday school's downstairs, and uh, Justice and Mercy Group is meeting in the chapel. It's wonderful to see that crowd in there, and if you have, didn't get a chance last week, come and join us today. It is uh, really a, a, a it'll, it'll be really uh, educated as we go through this together. Um, tomorrow, Monday, Fellowship com Committee is meeting at 7 o'clock in the chapel, so if you are a part of that group, we invite you to come to that meeting with some things to plan in the coming uh, months. Uh, also, choirs begin this week, so Tuesday, chancel ringers, the bells uh, begin at 6.45 Tuesday evening. Wednesday, youth choirs at 5.15, cherub at 5.30, and the senior choir is at 7. Uh, Wednesday is also confirmation. The classes begin at 6.30, and then uh, the crazy chaos happens at 7.45. Thursday, our noon Bible study. Uh, we just started up Thursday. This is our second, uh, and we are going to be in Matthew 16. So if you'd like to come at noon on Thursday and hang out with us for an hour, uh, we'd love to see you. So if you want to read Matthew 16 this week ahead of time, that would be great. Finally, just some sign-ups. Eat Boldly is out there coming up uh, first Friday of October, as well as golf is going to be taking place uh, on the 8th of October. So if you'd like to sign up and come out and uh, play nine holes with us, uh, please sign up today. I think that's all the announcements I need to make at this time. I invite you to receive God's blessing. The God of glory, Jesus Christ, name above all names, and the Spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen. We sing, Rise Up, O Saints of God, number 669.